Welcome to the Castilla de Sangro virtual tour, including the actions of the West Nova Scotia Regiment on 23-24 November 1943. I want to start by orienting you to the ground. Castilla de Sangro itself is in central Italy. It is uh, a couple hundred kilometers to the east of Rome. And it lies at the base of the Abruzzo mountain range and where that intersects with the river Sangro coming in here. So this is important because in 1943, uh, the Germans intended to use the Sangro and the Abruzzo mountain range as a barrier, a natural barrier to the Allied advance. So this was their winter line uh, and it became known as the Gustav line. And it was where the, the Germans had intended to stop the Allies, if not permanently, at least for the winter of 43-44. So let's zoom in a little bit and uh, we'll take a look at why this is an imposing feature. So as you can see, this is the, the Sangro River Valley that comes in here, and it meets at Castilla Sangro, with point 1009 dominating the area. Uh, this way, a very dominating and, uh, and difficult terrain feature with the Abruzzo mountain range, uh, certainly not something that is easily passable even to uh, seasoned infantry soldiers. So, point 1009 sits atop the, uh, the town of Castilla Sangro itself, and it is tactically important because with the Abruzzos being part of the Gustav line, so this is where the Germans intend to make their stand, uh, this point here is very dominating for the local area. So it can see through the valleys. Uh, this is, in fact, the, the Sangro Valley right here. It runs through the town and beyond. And from point 1009, it has a very commanding and dominating view of that entire valley, uh, not for direct action. However, uh, if you have an OP here, small contingent, it's very easy to monitor possible movements and to call in indirect fire whenever needed. So this is a key position to holding this valley. Now, if we go back out a little bit, this is important to the Allies because in November 1943, all of the Sangro River is in Allied hands, except this point right here. So this is the last piece of the puzzle to taking the entire Sangro River Valley and uh, as part of the, the process, uh, breaking the Gustav line. So from here, we will move over to San Pietro Avellana. This is a town that's nearby, and it is where the West Nova Scotia Regiment had their battalion headquarters. So right here is a brickwork. Uh, this is an old brick furnace factory, and uh, although, again, you, you can't see the the buildings here, they don't, uh, they don't display well in this tool. Uh, this is a tall structure with a chimney here. Um, and, and this is where the battalion headquarters was. So there's, there's tunnels within the brickworks here uh, that were used for protection. However, uh, you can imagine that a battalion-sized organization is not going to fit in there. So headquarters and, uh, and certain folks were allowed access to the tunnels and protection from the elements. The remainder of the battalion uh, would have stayed in the open areas around. So that meant that in November, uh, coming winter in Italy, they had no protection from the elements, no protection from the wind, the rain, uh, and the cold, cold wind would have been blowing down from the snow-capped mountains. Uh, it would have been a very unpleasant situation for our fellows. So this was battalion headquarters as of 20 November 1943, and after this was established, the West Novas established an observation post here that they called the Raven's Nest. And again, you can understand why this would be a good observation post. So this was used, again, to, to observe uh, enemy movements. The Germans were just here to the front of us, including point 1009. Uh, so this was an excellent location to observe their movements and to call in potentially indirect fire on them as well. Uh, so this was established uh, on the, the 21st, 22nd, and uh, the Germans, thinking the same thing, that this was an excellent spot, also attempted to establish uh, a small presence there. Uh, they didn't know the West Novas were, were already established, and uh, after a little skirmish, one German was killed, the rest were, were fought off. Uh, but that's, uh, that was one point of, of uh, West Nova presence here. So let's go back to the brickworks. And on 23 November, uh, this would have been where the patrol was set out. And the, the reason, the genesis for the patrol, was that uh, 
the, the, the CEO, Lieutenant Colonel Boger, had visited the raven's nest, and given the observation he had of the area there, he decided, uh, along with the brigade and div commander, that it would be a prudent move to knock the enemy off of point 1009, take that terrain for their own, and then they could dominate this, this feature, uh, and, and in fact the entire uh, river valley there, which would be uh, a key point for holding the rest of the Sangro. So that was, uh, that was when and where the decision was made. It was actually made right there at the Raven's Nest. And as a result, on 23 November, at about uh, 2 a.m., our boys set off from the brickworks. And they set off on foot. It's about a seven and a half kilometer trek uh, as the crow flies, but of course it'd be a lot further given the, uh, the variances in height and they wouldn't have gone uh, in, a, in a direct line. So the, the small hill between the brickworks and point 1009, when you get down to ground level, actually does not look so small. So this, this is not the Abruzzo mountain range, it is just some tiny foothills in the area. Uh, but you can get a sense for the type of uh, terrain that, that our guys were, were facing. So this is, uh, this is certainly not easy going. And as the patrol proceeded, they would have picked a route of probably least resistance and, and least likelihood of running into enemy activity. And when they crested, uh, they would finally see in the distance their objective, point 1009. So along the way, the patrol came across a farm building. And this farm building uh, was actually full of civilians who were trying to avoid interaction with the Germans. Uh, and one of those individuals, uh, Angelo Petrarca, offered to go with the patrol to point 1009 and to guide them in. He was familiar with the local area, not a fan of the Germans, and uh, offered his services. Uh, unfortunately, he was killed during the ensuing action at point 1009. Uh, however, we consider him among our war dead. So the patrol, which consisted of uh, B Company under Captain Burns, would have proceeded again, now with their guide and understanding the terrain a little better. Uh, at this point, the, the patrol is, is moving along, but it's cold, it's dark, it's very windy, it's raining, uh, it's just misery. Uh, the, 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 the ground itself is soaking wet and uh, very unstable, so as they're, as they're making their way up and down these, these hills, uh, there's a lot of mud, a lot of slippage, and uh, it's, it's exhausting work. So before they even make it 2.1009, uh, they are all very, very tired, wet, and, uh, and uncomfortable. So at about this point, behind this hill, Captain Burns would have uh, stopped the company and would have indicated to Lieutenant Blanchard, who was a platoon commander within the company, that his job would be to go forward and put in the assault, with the other two platoons remaining back uh, as a potential reserve. So at this point, they didn't know how many Germans were, were on the point, or even if it was truly occupied. Uh, so Lieutenant Blanchard went forward with his platoon and he would have scouted around to try and find a way up. And as you can see, it's a, it's a, it's a fairly dominating feature over here. So he actually chose a path uh, somewhere along here, roughly about where uh, the actual road up to the top is. Uh, and he made it with his platoon all the way up here. And again, the buildings don't represent in 3D, but uh, the church is here and the tower behind. There were other buildings here. He made it all the way to the doorway of the church. And he uh, started to conduct house clearing. So he kicked in the door, or his platoon kicked in the door, uh, threw in a grenade, uh, started to fire, small arms fire into it. And it's not clear whether the Germans were waiting in ambush or whether they were just sort of asleep at the wheel. Uh, but certainly when the grenades and, and small arms fire went off, they knew the West Novas were there. Unfortunately, Lieutenant Blanchard's platoon, which was now... In, a, in sort of a courtyard here, uh, was caught in a vicious crossfire. So the church steeple is here, it's quite tall, and there was uh, Germans there with guns, there was Germans in the tower, there was Germans in the church itself, and there was Germans uh, in, the, in the outbuildings and of course in machine gun pits all around. So Lieutenant Blanchard's platoon was surrounded, it was outgunned, and uh, ultimately Lieutenant Blanchard was uh, mortally wounded. It's my understanding uh, from talking to some folks that he was wounded, he called for a withdrawal of the patrol, understanding that it was in uh, uh, in peril. And uh, he, he said something to the effect of, they're not gonna take me alive, stood up, rushed the building, and was subsequently shot in the head and killed. Uh, so at this point, 
the rest of the platoon is uh, is left to sort of fend for themselves. Uh, there's mass confusion. Uh, the Germans are, are uh, viciously putting down fire and grenades on them. Uh, some of them are captured, some of them are killed, and some of them manage to escape uh, probably behind this wall right here or something similar. So it's not much protection, and the Germans, including those up on the tower, and we'll look at the tower in, in sort of 3D in, in a little bit here, uh, would have uh, been able to, to have very accurate fire and grenades uh, put down on, on the Canadians here. Um, at this point, all hell's broken loose. So Captain Burns, back here, understands that there's an issue and decides he's going to send his forward, or pardon me, his remaining two platoons up. Uh, so Lieutenant Kurt's platoon attempts to come up and sort of do a frontal almost to rescue the West Novas that are trapped there. They meet the same resistance, heavy gun fire, uh, grenades, and so on, and they, they can't make any advance beyond or up the, up the face uh, on, on this side. Lieutenant Ronke's platoon attempts to flank on this side, so they come around. And as you can see, there's not much option here. So they, they, they attempt to find a way up, uh, but there's really no having it. Uh, it's too steep, and they also get pinned down. Uh, and they, they cannot make any move upwards. So at this point, uh, almost all of Captain Burns's company, all three platoons, are pinned down in and around the area of uh, the point 1009 here. Uh, as a result, uh, there's there's not much they can do. They can't escape. The Germans have uh, have them uh, targeted, and they, they remain there all through the night, taking fire and taking casualties. Uh, it isn't until the next morning that a fog rolls in and fills the entire valley and obscures the German view of these areas here. At that point, Captain Burns orders a withdrawal and his company, or what remains of it, is able to pull back. So this is uh, this is good news for them. Uh, they, they don't have a lot of time. That fog is going to burn off, so they have to they have to leave, and unfortunately, in, in some cases, they have to leave their wounded behind. Uh, some of the West Novas, who were uh, likely coming off of this side here, uh, broke arms and legs as part of the escape because they simply couldn't uh, get down this side safely. Uh, there is a, a, a tale of four West Novas, who, three of whom were, were wounded, some quite seriously, uh, including loss of an eye and, and shot through limbs and so on. Uh, they were separated from their group and they managed to make their way down to this little stream here. And there they stayed at a bend in the river. All day, the following day, into the night, the next night. And at that point, they made their way to a small farmhouse where Italians gave them some food, some rest, and a German, uh, German patrol that was passing shot at the house. And uh, they decided it was time to go. They were putting themselves at too much risk. So with the, the help of some Italian men, uh, they, those four soldiers actually made it back to uh, Royal 22nd Van Du lines, and uh, two of them actually made it back, uh, made a recovery enough to make it back to the regiment. Uh, but the other two, uh, their, their wounds prevented them from uh, rejoining the regiment. Uh, so it's quite a story, um, and more to follow on that in, in just a little bit. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Captain Burns's company has now withdrawn all the way back to the brickworks where the wounded and the exhausted are resting. Uh, and it's my understanding that as a result of uh, all that they've been through, uh, these folks were now sort of granted small areas to, to rest and recuperate in the brickworks itself. So let's go have a look at the actual Point 1009 uh, with a bit more detail. So here we are. Uh, this is a this is a bit of a better representation of the size of the the tower, uh, the church itself, and the surrounding area. So if we sort of do a 360 here. Uh, this direction would be where, where the Canadians approach from. Uh, Lieutenant Blanchard's platoon would have come up somewhere around here and would have come right into uh, the, the, uh, the church itself and made his assault here.
Here's a view of the tower and the church from the back side. So this, again, the Germans would have occupied this and had uh, machine gun pits all around here. In fact, there's some photos of, of Germans manning machine guns here, looking at Roca Sigamia uh, over in this direction. And this, uh, this would have been the view that the Germans had of the Canadians' approach. So you can see it's very, very exposed. In the distance, you can see uh, the hill that the Canadians climbed from San Pietro at Elena and the, uh, the raven's nest off in this direction. And they would have come all the way across this valley in the dark of night in the rain and then attempt to do assault up this hill and over these walls in order to, uh, to rout the Germans from this location. From this direction, you can see Roca Sigamilla, which is a town about five miles away from Castel de Sangro, and it is where uh, the Germans uh, had, had massacred 120 civilians in, uh, in these villages. Uh, those civilians were killed simply for not leaving when the Germans demanded that they abandon their homes and their village. So the same fate may have held for Silk and Sangro had the West Novas not attacked this point. And although uh, they, were, they were pushed back with losses on the first night, uh, a concerted attack was put in the following night uh, with the entire battalion and indirect fire support. And uh, it was so, the weight of fire was so heavy that uh, by the time the West Nova uh, ground troops made it to the top of the hill, the Germans had escaped off and rejoined, uh, except for their dead, had rejoined their, their folks uh, on the Gustav line. Uh, the, the Germans did leave our wounded in the basement of the church, uh, and they actually put them there as a bit of a protection from our own artillery, and they also uh, buried our war dead. So, uh, that wasn't discovered until Kuala forces were up on 1009, so we had moved on. We had no uh, idea what had happened to some of our folks, uh, but, but later on it was discovered that the Germans had, in fact, uh, done some ad hoc burial for our war day. I hope you found this useful. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact me at mike at army.ca. Thank you.